Okay, good morning everybody. We're about to kick off today's webinar, so thanks a million for joining us. Today we have two topics. We have getting ready for the auto enrollment surge with BrightPay, that will be presented by Paul Byrne. And then we have expand your offering and grow your business in 2016 by Mike Foster. Um, now our, today, our first speaker today is Paul Byrne. And Paul is the Managing Director here at BrightPay. Before he moved into the payroll software industry, Paul managed his own accounting practice for about 20 years. And as part of running that practice, he managed the payroll for about 30 clients. So he has a, a real understanding of what it's like on the front line to manage clients. Um, and today, Paul will present, as I mentioned earlier on, getting ready for the auto-enrollment surge with BrightPay. I'm delighted to welcome our second speaker today, which is Mike Foster. So Mike is the entrepreneur's mentor, and he has recently co-founded the Bookkeepers Alliance. And this is a membership organization that supports the continual professional development of bookkeepers. Mike really has a passion for supporting other professional service providers to start, develop, market, and grow their own businesses. With his entrepreneurial background, Mark will share, Mike will share with you his experience and thoughts on how to expand your offering and grow your business in 2016. So I'm really delighted to welcome Mike today, and the Bookkeepers Alliance is, is very much a great resource for bookkeepers. Um, now today you're quite welcome to type in your questions throughout the webinar. So on the right hand side, you should have a little control panel, it might just have a little orange arrow on it and there's a little question tab there. So if you do have any questions throughout the webinar, please type in your questions there. And at the end, we'll have probably a five or 10 minute Q&A session where we'll get through as many questions as we can. Now the good news is today we have a free competition for um, some Bright Pay Bureau licenses. And the, the competition is for two Bright Pay licenses and it's open to everybody who stays for the duration of the webinar. So good luck everybody. Um, today's webinar is also going to be recorded. So for your convenience, we'll also send a recording of today's webinar. If you, know, if you wanted to have a look at anything afterwards or share it with any of your colleagues, we'll send that uh, recording on to everybody. So I'll now pass it over to Paul and uh, Paul is going to get the webinar started today. So thanks a million and enjoy everybody. Okay, hi everyone and thank you for joining us today. Just a small bit about myself to start off. As uh, Karen was saying there, my background is as a practicing accountant. Uh, I started my own practice back in the 80s and eventually grew to a three-partner practice with 10 staff. While in practice, I provided payroll bureau services for about 30 clients, so I have some idea of what it is like in the front line. In 1992, I got into payroll software development. A large part of my reasoning for this was to make better software than what I was using at the time. Eventually, I began working in software development full-time, allowing us to focus on a wider range of software packages for both Ireland and the UK. Eventually, we introduced BrightPay and Bright Contracts. Unfortunately, I can't claim full credit for BrightPay, as, as it was written by someone younger and better than I, my fellow director, Ross Webster. Today, over 80,000 employers across the UK and Ireland use our products, and it's a figure that we are improving on every year. So here is the agenda for my slot today, which I hope you will find useful and give you plenty of food for thought. When talking, I will often refer to autumn enrollment or automatic enrollment as AE. For those of you, of you who have tuned into any of our previous webinars, apologies if I end up repeating some of the points previously made. Unfortunately, this is unavoidable. Just to say at the start, autumn enrollment is a vast and complex subject. It would take days, even weeks, to cover the subject properly. At the end of the day, you should not need to have an in-depth knowledge of AE. It is up to your pension provider and payroll software provider to filter out all the noise for you. The key question for accountants, bookkeepers and payroll bureaus is how you can provide auto-enrollment as a service in an efficient and profitable manner. And that is what we are going to try and cover today. You'll see from this slide 
that January 2016 is when the bulk of small and micro employers start to stage. This is the start of the so-called tsunami and things will definitely heat up from there on. By the end of September this year, over 60,000 employers had completed their declaration of compliance, enrolling 5.4 million eligible job holders into a workplace pension scheme. The pensions regulator estimates that over the next three years, around 1.8 million small and micro employers will need to act as a result of AE duties. It is predicted that 78% of these will turn to an accountant, bookkeeper or payroll bureau. So you have a gift wrapped business opportunity and, and this is business you don't have to go chasing. It is also estimated that 90% of an accountant's or bookkeeper's client base is made up of employers with less than 50 employees and it is from now onwards that these employers will be affected by auto enrollment. A lot of the companies staging before now will probably have had their own HR people or in-house accountants to help them through the enrollment process. The vast majority of those staging from January 2016 will have no in-house expertise. The majority of these employers will, have, will not have the knowledge or experience to make informed decisions when it comes to their AE obligations. So the vast quantity of information available, employers are fast becoming confused, bewildered and overwhelmed. So payroll bureaus need to decide if they are ready to take on AE business. With many shying away from offering this as an extra service, bureaus will need to determine what kind of information and support they will offer to help their clients comply with these new AE duties. Advisors will find that a large portion of employers will contact them very close to or even after their staging date. And just to note that if a client does contact you after their staging date and has done nothing, if their staging date has passed by less than six weeks, get them to issue postponement letters to all employees immediately. Otherwise, they will need to backdate AE back to the staging date. There are a number of benefits for your clients who outsource to you for auto enrollment. There will be significant time savings for your payroll clients. By outsourcing AE to a payroll professional, your client can avoid investing huge amounts of time researching how to comply with AE. The implementation of AE could also be very time consuming if your client doesn't have the correct technology or software in place to automate a lot of the AE admin tasks. Time is money as the saying goes. Without your help, your payroll clients might choose payroll software that doesn't have AE functionality. Even if it does, some payroll providers are charging an additional charge for AE functionality and a further charge to support your clients through the process. With a bureau, your client can avoid costly mistakes and save time that otherwise would have been taken out of their normal working week. Especially for uh, small and micro employers, their time is extremely precious. Time away from their business is money. Outsourcing AE to a payroll professional frees up their energies and enables them to focus on the core areas of running their business. Implementing AE requires skills that staff do not possess. Outsourcing will provide a level of continuity to the company while reducing the possible or the risk of possible non-compliance. So by offering a complete end-to-end -end solution, bureaus can generate income and enhance client relationships. If bureaus offer other services such as bookkeeping, tax returns, audits, management accounts, etc., they will have a new platform to reach and upsell to this new audience. You will find that employers will be happier to consolidate all their outsourcing services to one person or advisor. <clears throat> with AE comes a number of employer responsibilities. A pension scheme must be set up with a qualifying pension provider and this should be done in advance of your staging date. This should not require a great, great deal of time. For example, registering with Nest should take only 30 minutes on average to complete. And just to, to note here as well, that the latest uh, advice from the pensions regulator is that if you, if you don't have any eligible job holders, then you don't need to uh, register with a pension scheme in advance. This can be done once you actually do uh, have employees who are eligible or even non-eligible job holders that elect to opt in. Um, it will put some pressure on the, the task of 
getting everything set up at the time, but that, that is their latest guidance. Next, the workforce must be assessed at your client staging date, and all eligible job holders must be automatically enrolled into a workplace pension scheme, unless postponement is being used. All employees must receive communications within six weeks of the staging date, not just those who have been enrolled. You must notify eligible job holders, non-eligible job holders, and entitled workers, including those who have been postponed from AE, and how they have been affected. And again, just to, 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 to labour this point, apparently some employers believe that if they choose to postpone all employees for three months of the staging date, then nothing needs to be done in that three-month period. This is not the case, as all employees must receive a communication within six weeks of the staging date relating to, to, to the postponement and explaining when they will be enrolled. If this communication is, is not issued, then the postponement effectively never happened and enrollment must be completed retrospectively back to the staging date, which will in itself be a nightmare. There are a number of ongoing employer responsibilities, such as handling opt-outs and opt-ins, making deductions and contributions, monitoring employees each pay period, and sending a contribution file to the pension provider. Employers, or you on their behalf, must complete a declaration of compliance within five months of the staging date to notify the pensions regulator that they have complied with AE. <clears throat> Fortunately, modern innovative solutions exist that can automate, automate the AE chores. Armed with the employer staging date, bureaus can now simply enter the date to assess each employee's eligibility for AE at the staging date. Before staging, the employer or the bureau acting their be on their behalf should register with a pension provider. Again, this should not take long. Registering with Nest, for example, should take no more than half an hour. Before staging, you should also research software solutions to find one that will make your life easier. Staging is the most hands-on task involved, and although it can take an hour or two, it will become easier and faster for bureau providers for every new client that is staged. Tasks at staging include enrolling all relevant employees, communicating as required to all employees, and setting up and commencing employee deductions and employer contributions. Good payroll software will have print-ready employee AE communications based on each employee's individual eligibility. From that point on, it is just a matter of monitoring employees, submitting contribution files to the pension provider, and managing employees who opt in and opt out. Some payroll software monitors the age and earnings of employees in each subsequent pay period to see if any further enrollments are required and if any new employees should be enrolled. Each of, the, each of these enrollments should only take minutes to process. For large, repetitive or time-sensitive tasks, the speed of automated AE offers both significant cost-saving and time-saving benefits to bureaus. This will be especially relevant when these employers approach their bureaus close to or even after their staging date. AE does not need to be a major headache for bureaus and their clients, provided they take some time to make sure the right tools are in place to deal with it. AE should become a seamless part of the payroll process, much like RTI. So beware of possible additional costs. If automatic enrollment is not already included with your current software provider as standard, you may have to pay additional costs for AE functionality and support. Bureaus obviously have the option to consider an alternative software package that has AE features included and no hidden support charges. These are the things you need to check with your payroll software provider. Does the software assess your workforce? Does it allow the use of postponement? Does it automate the employee communications? Does it calculate the pension contributions? Does it handle opt-ins and joining? Does it handle opt-outs and refunds? Does it notify you when actions need to be taken? Does it keep records and provide reports? Does it integrate with some or all pension scheme provider systems? And does it provide free, free support? And if you are selecting new software, you should ensure that it is compatible with your existing systems. So now we're going to look at how BrightPay handles auto-enrollment tasks. 
RightPay is an integrated payroll and auto enrollment solution that works to automate and simplify the AE process. We try to make it as easy as possible for you to help your clients achieve compliance while saving you both time and money. We've helped many employers with their AE duties over the past year. We've learned a thing or two about what is important to bureaus who have payroll clients and how we as payroll software providers can make it easy for you to complete these employer tasks. Firstly, to cover the basics, BrightPay can handle weekly, fortnightly, four-weekly and monthly payment schedules and it even has the ability to handle an annual schedule. Also, basic daily, hourly and statutory pay are easily dealt with. Payslips can be emailed directly from the payroll so to, to your client's employees with a password secure PDF attachment. BrightPay handles all RTI submissions. It automatically creates full payment submissions as you progress through the payroll year. The list goes on when it comes to payroll. Today with auto enrollment, what's very important to note is that BrightPay has auto enrollment functionality as standard and AE is included in the price. Generally, the process of assessing each and every employee can be time consuming. From your client staging date, all eligible job holders will need to be automatically enrolled into a workplace pension scheme. BrightPay accesses employee, employees' PUI information and based on the employee's wages and age, BrightPay will assess and calculate who needs to be enrolled. BrightPay will further alert you to what your AE obligations are for each employee based on their employee category. Once you have a pension scheme in place, the ease and speed of enrolling employees is fundamental to the AE process. Eligible, eligible employees will have the option to opt out of a pension scheme within a month of being enrolled. Equally, non-eligible job holders will have, will have the option to opt into a workplace pension scheme. BrightPay is capable of enrolling eligible employees, processing opt-out and opt-in requests, refunding all deductions already made, and showing this refund on the payslip. A useful feature in BrightPay is the option to process more than one employee at the same time which can save a lot of time if your clients have a large number of employees. Communicate, communicating with your clients' employees is a mandatory part of auto-enrollment. The letter must explain to each and every employee how an auto-enrollment affects them. In addition, it is important to make sure that each employee receives the correct communication based on their individual work status. The pensions regulator has also outlined specific requirements that need to be included in the content of these letters to employees. While there are a number of free letter templates available for bureaus to process manually, this will be quite time consuming to customize each letter to each individual employee with their contribution, rates, staging date and personal details. BrightPay automatically prepares tailored automatic enrollment letters customized to each individual employee ready for printing or emailing. Employers have the option to postpone automatic enrollment for up to three months for some or all of their staff. If your client chooses the option to postpone, a letter must be produced informing employees that they have been postponed. On the last day of the postponement period, each of the postponed employees will need to be reassessed to determine the work category and enroll if necessary. The option to postpone AE is built into BrightPay, including alerts when the postponement period has expired. Again, it will save you time if the employee communications that details the postponement is automated within the software compared to manual, manually producing the documentation. BrightPay also allows you to postpone multiple employees at the same time. Once a client has reached their staging date and automatically enrolled employees, your AE responsibilities do not stop there. AE means that you must also monitor any changes to the employee's work status. For example, if an employee's income exceeds the threshold, currently £192 per week, or if an employee reaches the age 22, their worker category will change. BrightPay software will recognize this change to the employee's work status and automatically inform you of your AE obligation and produce the necessary communications. There is no need to run or export a report each pay period. Payroll software should, should continuously monitor staff to ensure that employees are automatically enrolled when they become an eligible job holder. BrightPay does alert you to such events and prompts you to perform the necessary action, be it enroll or postpone, making your job easier. 
It will be important to maintain a schedule of contributions and ensure that you can make the correct payments uh, to each, for each employee. BrightPay will automatically set up the phase minimum contribution levels for you. There is also an option to set up custom contribution levels if you decide to change the percentage contributions for employees. At each pay period, BrightPay will automatically make the relevant contributions and deductions for each of your client's employees based on the, pen, the chosen pension scheme and the percentage contributions the employer has decided on. These contributions and deductions must then be included uh, on each employee's pay slip. BrightPay can make these deductions and keep up to date with the contributions. Integration with AE pension providers will also be a key consideration to think about when weighing up the various pension or payroll solutions out there. And BrightPay is currently compatible with the 14 pension providers you see on the screen there. There are certain records that must be kept by, by law uh, by both the employer and the pension scheme as proof of compliance. Employers must record this information about their employees and their chosen pension scheme. These records must be kept for a minimum of six years. For each employee, you must keep the communications containing opt-ins, joining and opt-out notices. These must be kept for four years. These records must be kept in a certain format for the pensions regulator. The way payroll software providers are pricing their auto-enrollment functionality completely varies across the industry. Certain solutions are choosing to charge extra per employee per month, which could quickly add up especially as the demand for auto-enrollment grows. Others have decided to charge a completely separate fee for an auto-enrollment feature, add-in, add-on or module. Some packages on the market do, do have auto-enrollment included, but the functionality can be basic or limited. It will be cost-effective to select a solution such as BrightPay, where there are no additional charges per employee or per payroll client. So make sure to read the small print and be aware of hidden support charges too. These hidden costs can add up and ultimately affect your bottom line. Some payroll providers have limitations to the auto enrollment features and functionalities they offer. BrightPay can handle and automate the employer auto enrollment duties for you. Additionally, a number of providers only allow you to process a certain number of employees or payroll clients before the, the cost increases significantly. While a large portion of the employers might be eligible, there are still duties that need to be completed for non-eligible and entitled workers. Check that there are no limitations when it comes to AE functionality and ensure there are no restrictions with the number of employees or employers that can be set up. So I'm going to hand you over to Vicky, who is our UK support manager here at BrightPay, and she's going to give you a quick demo just showing you just how easy auto enrollment can, can be with BrightPay. In this example, we are assuming that the employer, or you on their behalf, has already registered with a pension provider, in this case Nest. Registering with Nest, as I said earlier on, should, should take only 30 minutes on average to complete. So over to you, Vicky. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Let me just get set up here. Now, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so just to provide you now just with a short demo of auto-enrollment working in BrightPay. So the starting point is when you are in receipt of your staging date. And as soon as you have it, um, you're simply accessing the pensions utility within the software and selecting the automatic enrollment option here at the top of the screen. So you have a dedicated field to enter your staging date in. And by entering the date here, this then means that BrightPay will kick in at the right time for you to alert you that you now have automatic enrollment duties to perform. Um, as soon as you have details of your pension scheme, so as soon as you're set up with a pension scheme, again, these details can be entered in BrightPay in advance of staging. And that is simply done by clicking Add New, uh, sorry, Add New Scheme on the menu bar at the top and selecting the relevant pension scheme. So as Paul has just mentioned, we currently support 14 pension providers as displayed on the screen there for you. And should you be with another pension scheme that we don't um, cover directly, you have the option over here to set up an other automatic enrollment scheme where you can enter details accordingly. So in this example this morning, we're going to just use Nest. So I'm going to select Nest from the listing and you simply enter your employer reference and again this will be provided by Nest themselves and then on the following screen 
um, you're going to enter your group details. So again, these will match exactly how you have set them up with the pension provider. So for example, you may have weekly employees, you may have a group called weekly. And on the same screen here, this will give you the um, ability to select the contribution rates that are applicable. So whether you're using the minimum or whether you want to use the 2018 or whether you wish to customize them. At the same time, further down, you also have the ability to set the earnings basis. So whether you wish to use the standard qualifying earnings or whether you wish to customize these. Should you have further groups, for example, you may have employees on a different pay frequency and you may require a different group for those, or you may have employees on the same pay frequency but ha who have different contribution rates. So further groups can be added accordingly here. So I may have monthly, for example. So once completed, simply click Save and that will save details of your pension scheme. What BrightPay also offers is an assessment tool. So at the top here, if I click on the assessment button, um, this will allow you to perform both a pre-staging and post-staging assessment of your employees. So there are two options for the pre-staging um, assessment, without opt-ins or with opt-ins. And I'll just click on, on the with opt-ins here. And this is basically going to give you an overview of what auto-enrollment will look like once an employer stages. So that is what worker category each employee is likely to fall into. And it will be based on the current pay period that you've generated this report in. And also what their estimated qualifying earnings and contribution amounts will be. So again, they're an estimation. Further down, the document here then provides general information on, on employee assessment. And so for payroll bureaus, this is quite a useful report that can be sent over to your clients, um, for example, a few months ahead of staging, just to give them um, the overview there. Okay. So returning to the, um, the software here. So as soon as you reach your staging date in the software, so in this example, we are staging on the 1st of January. BrightPay will then automatically assess your employees for you. So BrightPay will determine whether your employees are eligible job holders, non-eligible job holders, or entitled workers. And you will see now these on-screen flags. And if I select an employee, also these yellow alerts appearing. And that's just to inform you now that you have AE duties to perform for the employees in question. So my first employee here, she is being assessed as an eligible job holder. So if I simply click on view options here, I'm given three options for this worker category. So I can enroll the employee, I can postpone them, or I can mark them as exempt if applicable. So in this example here, we will enroll the employee. So simply click the enroll button and select the scheme from the listing that you wish to enroll them in. Then select the applicable tax relief and press continue to complete their enrollment. So BrightPay will then also automatically prepare your enrollment letters for you. Um, and by clicking on letter here, you will be given the option in the software to either print these, to export them to PDF or to email them directly from BrightPay to the employee if you have at the employee's email address. So I'll just, do a, I'll just select the print option here for you. Um, this will give the user then um, the ability to amend margins, paper size, etc. And if I just do a print preview, we have on screen now um, the, an, a, an example of the enrollment letter for the employee. So this is going to um, include information about the employee's staging date, what their contribution rates are, how they can opt out should they choose to do so, um, and just general information on what automatic enrollment will mean to them. Okay. Once the employee is in receipt of their enrollment letter, be it by email or by um, you know, a printed version, you can simply then instruct the software that this has been done. So mark as done for this employee. Okay, and you'll see now if I return to my payroll screen, I've completed my automatic, en uh, automatic enrollment duties for this employee. So my next employee in the listing is being assessed as a non-eligible job holder this time. So if I click on view options, I get slightly different um, options for this worker category. So I'm first given the option to write to them, um, inviting them to opt in. 
And should they choose to opt in, then the opt in button here, and then also to postpone and mark them as exempt. And then my third employee here is um, being assessed as an entitled worker. And so the options we have available for her, again, is to write to them, inviting them to join. Um, should they subsequently choose to do so, you have the join option and then postpone and mark as exempt. So should you wish to postpone an employee, this is simply done by selecting the postpone option here. And all you need to do is just enter the deferral date I'll say it's the 1st of March here, and you can press continue. Once again, Brightpo will then automatically prepare um, the postponement letters for postponed employees, and this again is done by clicking letter, and again, you'll be given the three options to print, export to PDF, or email directly to the employee. And then once done, you can mark as done again. Okay, so a useful feature in Brightpay is the option to batch process employees, so rather than go through each employee on an individual level. So you'll see here at the time of selecting an eligible job holder, should I go to enrol her, you'll see here that I'm given the option to enrol multiple employees with the same settings. So if I select this option here, I can select all. I've got four um, eligible job holders here, and I click Enroll Selected Employees, and they are all enrolled together with the click of the button there. Likewise, their enrollment letters can be prepared in a batch, and again, simply by clicking Letter and selecting the option Create Send Letter for Multiple Employees, so selecting whether you want to print, export, or email them. And again, once completed, you can mark as done for multiple employees like so. And that's their automatic enrollment duties dealt with. Similarly, postponement can also be done in a batch. So if you're wishing to postpone all employees or just a number of employees, um, again, if you select an employee and their postpone option, enter their deferral date, and you can select the option to postpone assessment until the enter date for multiple employees. And again, you can select the applicable employees, postpone selected employees, and again, create and send their postponement letters all in the one go. Okay. So you'll see now if I return to my payroll screen, my flags and alerts have disappeared. So I've dealt with all um, my AE duties at this point in time. So once employees have been um, enrolled or have joined or opted in, if I just return to the oh, sorry, payroll screen there, kind of sorry, sorry, you'll see that the pension deductions are now flowing through to their payslip. And if I finalize payslips here for this pay period and do a print preview of a payslip, you'll see those pension deductions flowing through onto their payslip for you. Okay. So once you've finalized your pay period and once you've dealt with that, um, all your duties in your, um, you know, when your staging date falls, um, you will then be required, just based on the pension provider you are with, to submit either an enrollment file, if applicable to the pension scheme you've selected, and also subsequent contributions files. So for NEST, they require an enrollment file, first of all, and followed by a contributions file. And that's to report then the contributions that you are, are making to NEST. So for NEST, there are two options. There is a CSV file option, um, and also they have developed um, recently an API option. So I'll show you in this demo how the API option works. So when we return to the pensions utility here, on the menu bar next to NEST, if you select the option Edit um, Details in Groups and Return to Registration Details, you have two options here under Submission Methods. So you can choose CSV File Upload or NEST Web Service. So to avail of the API option, simply select the NEST Web Service here, and then enter your user ID and password which you use to log into your NEST portal. And then once complete, save changes. So as NEST first of all require an enrollment file to be submitted to them, simply select enrollment file on your menu bar. So 
sorry, just sorry, Rachel, I just made a mind. Sorry, that's it. I can reach my, my link there. Um, and then select the option to send enrollment submission. Okay. So at step one, simply select the employees you wish to include in your enrollment file. Click on next. Step, sorry, step two, enter your payment source. And again, this needs to match exactly how you have set it up with Nest. And there is a quick um, copy down option here if you have a good number of employees. Okay. Click on next. And at step three, this is your submission, albeit it looks a little bit gobbledygook, but this works very similarly to RTI, that with the click of the Send Now button, this will be submitted straight into Nest. We're just obviously in a test environment now, I can't click Send Now, but um, if I did and it's um, received successfully from Nest, you will then get confirmation up at the top right here to say that your employees have been accepted. So I just use a quick little cheat key there and um, so you'll get the message to say that all employees have been included likewise to submit a contributions file um, every pay period after staging you select the option contribution summary on the menu bar and click send submission and again just on the first screen enter your payment source if it's not already there and then enter your payment due date at step two, select the employees that you wish to include. And at step three, just complete any reasons. So if there's been any employees where there's only been a partial contribution or non-payment of contributions in the pay period, you can select the reason for this. So complete accordingly. And then at step four, you are ready to submit your contributions file. So again, you click send now. And then you just wait for that confirmation to come back in here. Okay, and that message there will be updated accordingly for you. Okay, so BrightPay is also able to handle any opt-out request that the employer receives. And this is done by simply um, accessing the employees menu here and selecting the applicable employee that you've received the opt-out request for. So all you need to do is click on their automatic enrollment option here. And once enrolled, the employee will then have an opt-out option within this utility. So simply click opt-out, enter their opt-out date accordingly, and the opt-out reference that you have been given here. And should I click continue here, you'll just be asked, are you sure you wish to opt-out? Say yes. Then if I return to my payroll um, utility and go into the next open pay period, You'll see that if the employer has already made contributions previously, then on receipt of the opt-out request, as soon as it's processed, you'll see the refund of contributions coming back, both for the employee and for the employer. Okay. So for your own reporting requirements, the analysis function within the software can be accessed at any time. And by clicking on New Report, you can run any kind of AE report here to suit your needs. So for example, if I just click in here, for example, under period, you may choose to run a report on, for example, um, worker category, enrollment dates, opt-in dates, etc. here. Likewise, under employer items, should you wish to just run a pension um, report, for example, you may just want to run your own little contributions report here. You can select these options here. Click OK, run report and you have your automatic enrollment report here. All reports you generate in the analysis function um, can be edited and then they can be saved and they can also be marked as a favorite report by clicking the favorite option here and if you click on save here, it will then be added to your favorite report. So if it's a report you're going to use ongoing, that's a good idea to do. Okay. So just returning to the pensions utility here under the automatic enrollment option, um, as soon as you have completed your declaration of, of compliance, which is due within five calendar months after staging, there is the, the field here for you to record the date that you've submitted that, um, so simply enter it in this field provided here. There's also the option in this screen here as well to turn off communications. So as you've seen, BrightPay will prepare your enrollment letters um, 
and postponement letters, for example, and you know your non-eligible and entitled workers letters for you. But should you be with a pension provider that is taking care of the communications for you, um, you won't want BrightPay to do those. You know, so you you may just want to turn those reminders off, and that can be simply done by unticking these buttons here. Okay. So that's all your duties completed at staging. Um, BrightPay will continue to monitor your employees for you from this point onwards. So for example, a new starter joining or maybe an employee turning 22 with qualifying earnings. So should that happen, you will then be flagged, you know, it will be flagged to you in the software. Okay, so that completes the demo there. I will now pass you back to Paul. Okay, thank you for that, Vicky. As usual, very professional demonstration there. <laughs> Uh, you even show me some things I don't really know exist. Um, that uh, the API is actually quite exciting because that's going to save an awful lot of time for for bureaus. Um, I think we're probably ready to hand over to Mike now at this stage. You hear me now? Okay. Get that back up. Okay. So um, as I promised, I'd speak about today is about expanding your offering and growing your business in 2016. So. Um, Thank you for the kind introduction earlier. Just a little bit about myself very briefly. Um, as Karen kindly mentioned, we've recently co-founded the Bookkeepers Alliance. I co-founded that with uh, Chris McCulloch, um, many people will know. Um, for a decade, I ran my own bookkeeping practice, of which I franchised and sold in 2013. And predominantly what I do is I help other business owners to, to start, develop, market, and grow their business. And we've been asked really to share with you my thoughts around expanding your offering and growing your business in 2016, because it's not far away now. So we're going to cover a few areas. We're going to first of all, look at some of the barriers to, to your growth. Look at seven systemized steps to grow your business. Look around your relationship and those opportunities to expand. And then if, in effect, once you know what you want to do, how can you make that happen with effective goal planning and high payoff activities? Now, I'd like to share um, this image because I truly believe that you're doing what you do because you're good at it. And hopefully it's what you love to do. And I see my role really with the people that I work with and help um, is to help you have a business that pays you well. Otherwise, it's an element of you may be happy but, but poor. So the first bit I said we'd sort of touch upon is those common pitfalls and barriers to growth. And it's really looking at some of the research that says, okay, what's the common reasons for businesses failing or not growing? And it's really so that you're aware of these things and you can, in effect, plan around those rather than becoming barriers to stop you in the future. So what are they? Well, first of all, looking at the common pitfalls, you can see in terms of the, the, the research points to a number of things, but I think you can categorize two key areas is, first of all, your cash and people. So looking at things like your cash, you know, not having enough capital in the first place at startup, your bad debts, poor credit control, not controlling your overheads, but also in terms of managing your people, in terms of your communication, your bad management of people. But one that really jumps out at me all the time is about poor market research, because I, I find particularly at startup stage, people ask their friends and family around them, but don't do effective market research. And once they get into the startup mode, actually find that their product or their offering doesn't actually fit the marketplace that they want to serve. That leads us then into the barriers to growth in terms of well, what actually stops people from growing their uh, business. And again, people and cash are evident in these um, bullet points of the research, but again, a lack of planning is very evident here. You know, lack of strategy, no marketing plan, for example. And again, one that really jumps out for me here is not finding the right people, whether that's the right people around you as an employed resource or having the right advisors and um, network of contacts around you. So what stops the majority of us taking action? Well, the top three that I tend to find within the professional service market is time, lack of a system and attitude and motivation and taking those in reverse order I think quite often the attitude and motivation is sometimes around fear and our own limiting beliefs and I encourage people I work with to you know understand what truly motivates them and why they want to be in business I think the issue around not having a system or having a lack of a system is then the business can be too reliant on the business owners but I think it always the main consideration that I get feedback all the time is about not having enough time and it's always considered to be the key barrier to growth and hopefully I'll touch on this at the, the end of the presentation but in effect we all have the same amount of time, it's about how effective we manage that, that time. 
But one of the things I'm very focused on is not just focusing on the sales. I, I pick up um, clients in the past where they've worked with coaches and organizations to help them grow their number of clients, and obviously we all need new clients, but actually the business has been close to falling over because they've not thought about the foundation for their business. They've not thought about do they need more staff, different premises, how they're going to keep control of the quality in the relationship when they may be passing those clients to other people to manage. And obviously our working capital and a cash flow um, impacts in terms of that growth. Because sometimes, particularly when we're starting the growth from a sole trader perspective, is that we need to take a step backwards perhaps on our own income to grow forward. So one of the key areas I said I'd focus on today is the seven systemized steps of uh, growing your business. And I, I talk quite regularly about these seven steps. And it's not too dissimilar to what Sir David Brailsford talks about with British Cycling and the marginal gains philosophy. And what Sir David Brailsford did was British Cycling took all the different elements of cycling, whether that's what you wore, what you ate, what you were, your training regime, obviously the bike itself and the different elements of the bike, stripped all that down and improved each ind individual element by just a percent. And then actually put the elements all back together and then the cumulative effect is much greater. So how does that apply to running a professional service business as well? The seven steps that I'm going to take you through now um, are looking at your number of leads, how you convert more, how you sell more, how you get focused on your prices and your margin management, and how you retain your clients for longer. And we're going to look at these seven steps very briefly. Um, with the Bookkeepers Alliance, we are looking at these uh, seven steps in a bit more detail with some workshops, but I'm going to give you an overview of each of the seven steps. The first one, and as a marketer here, I would say the most important one is your marketing. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have leads, you don't have um, customers coming into your inquiry system, then you've got nobody to sell to, nobody to convert, nobody to price to, and nobody to retain. So you need to be very focused with um, your marketing. And I break this down into two areas, your strategy and your tactics. In terms of the strategy, is knowing who you actually want to work with, your ideal client profile, as I call it. And once you know your ideal client profile of the type of client that you want to work with, the key aspect for me is to truly understand their pain problem and their fear. What is it that causes them a pain, causes them a problem, and what they have a fear for? Because then you can develop your offering and the, the package, if you like, that you want to offer into the marketplace to, to match that pain problem and, and fear. The other aspect of then knowing your ideal client profile, you can then choose the relevant tactics to attract them because there are a number of different tactics, whether that's online or offline, that we can choose. But if we truly know our ideal client profile, then we can choose those appropriate tactics. So an example I always use is that if somebody doesn't, um, if their ideal client doesn't use the web or online, then we wouldn't necessarily want to be doing online social media, web trafficking, etc. So Again, our tactics can be most appropriate, and obviously our messages can be very appropriate to our ideal clients. But the key aspect is, with our marketing, we have to be proactive. And I think it's being proactive even during our busy times, that we therefore create a number of lead flow systems. The second area is, once we've got the number of leads um, generated for our business, how do we convert those into sales? And a key aspect is knowing what's important to your prospect and therefore your unique selling point and what's important to them and what's what I call your differentiator, what differentiates you to your competitor but importantly putting yourself in their shoes and what's important to them. Another key aspect and I'm sure you've all seen this yourselves is knowing the influences to that decision. So for example the question mark in the middle is your prospect but you can see a number of different influences that may be helping them make their decision about to, to use your service or not. That could be a trusted employee that's like their left arm that's worked for them for 40 years. It could be a business advisor. It could be a partner, whether it's a partner in the business or a husband, wife, etc. Or it could be you know another business associate they may even know down the pub, for example. There's other different ways that we can um, look at our conversion rates and one of the key aspects is about being honest with ourselves and reviewing how well we've done and what we can tweak next time. But the key one again I'd pick out from this list in this brief overview for you is the, the pain and gain. Knowing what the pain and problem is of your ideal client and how you match your solution to that pain. So therefore what's the pain of not using you and the gain of using you. 
when our customer buys from us from the first time, they're very much in that buy-in mode. So how can we uncover all those needs at that first sale? Because we don't really want to miss the opportunity. And quite often I see um, clients that I've worked with that they get a sign on the dotted line for one element of their service and therefore are quite delighted and quite rightly so, but forget to raise the other cross-sale opportunities. So how can you make people aware? Can you make them aware of all your services? Can you give them a pack, for example? Can you have a checklist that you'd be um, running through during that conversation? But also not just the services you offer. Is there an external service that you can link to? And it's very appropriate that we're talking about auto-enrollment today because an external advisor could be, for example, a financial advisor that you could link into to then for advise you or advise your clients, for example, around pension schemes, etc. The fourth area is then around the value of your sales, um, and therefore one of the key aspects we can do is increase our prices, but also it may be an opportunity for you to review your pricing strategy, because I suppose a question I would ask is, is your price potential limited by how you price today? So therefore, I, we're seeing a little bit of movement at the moment, but quite a lot of professional service providers um, are pricing on chargeable hourly rates, and are we moving more towards the fixed rates, the value pricing, or the menu pricing? And there is a little bit of reluctance of doing so because we may lose clients, but from my experience, we tend to lose those clients that are not our ideal clients, and perhaps those clients that don't value us. And by losing those clients, what does that do? That gives us more time back, and that gives us more time to work on winning more ideal clients, or more time to work on our business. The other aspect in terms of how can we upsell our business or how can we create more value in terms of our sales. And I'll use a great example of the water lettuce shares example and I'm sure some of you may have heard this before but I'll just pick one of them which is the shares and I did economics in my exams and a share price is a share price but at the end of the day if I went to Disney and I got a one share in a picture frame that said happy birthday Mike then to a degree someone's repositioned that and they've uplifted the value of that share. So what can we do around our own businesses to reposition what we're already offering? Another element is to look at uh, margin cost management, and I've just done this with one of my clients in terms of looking at how we review the existing um, jobs that they do and how can we cut any related costs, and just simply by using some of the online things that we've actually just been listening to from Brightpay about automating and about PDFs and about emailing payslips, for example, we can say things like stationary and postage costs and all these little things add up, but a big one for me was about resourcing the jobs. And, um, my own experience really was I was sending someone to the north of our county to do a job and then the next day they would go into the same location. It was about actually resourcing that more effectively and can we in effect map out our routes and make sure we're using our resources to the best of our ability. How can we then encourage our clients to buy more often from us? And we've seen this in particularly in the accountancy market over the last few years where most accountancy firms now would offer a tax investigation protection service, a couple of hundred pound maximum to protects their selves, but again, most of their clients take that up and very rarely does it perhaps get claimed upon. So it's an easy add-on to their, their services. But one of the things for me is how can you easily remind yourself that you um, want to try and upsell your clients, for example, or it may be that once you grow your business, you need to remind your staff to um, do that upsell for you. And a very simple thing you can do is a client's name down the left-hand side, your products across the top, and again, you can put some crosses in there in terms of the service they're already buying. You may wish to run a traffic light system in terms of green being, yes, they've already brought that service, a red, they've declined it, or an amber gives them potential. Again, a few other ideas that may enable you to buy more often, or you get your clients to buy more often from you. Um, and one I particularly talk about here would be about the third party knowledge of your customer. Quite a lot of new business for professional service organizations comes from referrals. So take the opportunity to go back to the person who's referred that client to you in the past and just have a conversation. Do you know anything more about X, Y, Z? And it may be that you will get some information that, oh yeah, well, F Fred was talking to me the other day about setting up a new business. And that would perhaps give you some information that you may not be aware of that you can perhaps use in terms of the next time you meet that person or the next time you're speaking to them. And the seventh and final step in this, this section is really about retention. I, I don't think professional service organizations, from my experience, have a great issue with uh, retention, but one of the big ones for me, particularly in the growth, is about keeping it personal. One of the reasons I left banking was it moved from being individuals that I knew to therefore having to use account numbers as reference all the time. So how can you be aware of that when you're growing your business and keep it personal, even if you've got to step back from the business owner from being in a technical role to being in a manager or owner role. 
So they, again, just a repeat of the seven steps. And what I'd encourage you to do is, in effect, do your own numbers. Put in your own numbers now for those seven steps. Put a 10% increase and see the impact. And I can assure you, you'll see the cumulative effect that can impact on your bottom line. And for me, give you the motivation to give that a try. Well, we then want to talk really around the value of our existing relationships and not underestimating that value that we have. Because I think particularly some of the relationships I see with my clients and, and their own customers is that they truly become more like friends, if you like. And I think it's because people trust us. They ask us to do a task that perhaps they don't really want to do themselves. They've already made that decision. They may have been referred to us by somebody else they, they trust and respect already. So I do believe that we have the ear, if you like, of our um, customers to be able to ref refer other products and sell to them again. Um, I say the word sell, but I actually encourage my clients to encourage their customers to buy from them again. I just think uh, that what we don't do is we just don't ask enough. But one of the key aspects is to know the value of your relationships. And this can particularly relate to your marketing. So for example, if I was a bookkeeper and I was charging my clients £200 per month and I was charging every single month for something I was doing, that's worth to me 2400 per annum. And if I think, well, actually the average retention of my customer is going to be six years, that gives me a lifetime value of that customer for um, £14,400. And that's before we get any additional cross sales from them or that they're a delighted customer so they refer us to somebody else and therefore give me as a business even more value. I suppose my question to, to yourselves and to, to many others is how much are you prepared to invest in that, that gain of that value? Now, some people will say it's £10 going to a networking event and seeing if I'm lucky to pick up that relationship. Some people will say it's £13,000 to pick up that 14400 Where is it for you and how much are you prepared to invest in your marketing to attract that type of value to your business? Now, one of the key areas that I said we would cover today is looking at extending your offering in 2016. And there's... I see certainly in the professional services market, we're seeing a movement in terms of the type of role that we're, we're undertaking as more of an advisory role coming through. Um, there may be opportunities to you just to increase the day-to-day -day data management that you're doing for your clients. It could be more around the movement we're seeing to the cloud in terms of software and technology and how can you get involved in making a recommendation or helping them with the implementation, the setup, the training that... Uh, I think most micro and small businesses don't really have the time or the desire to, to look into that and therefore stay with the example that they're, of software they may already be using. One of the areas I saw many particular bookkeepers um, not implement into their business is, is credit control. And I think that's predominantly because we may have the fear of picking up the telephone to do that credit control. But I think we can see with some of the credit control software providers in the market right now, it is actually more about putting the system and a process in place. And at the end of the day, if there's one thing that we're really good at, it's about having good systems and being good administrators. So it's credit control should be a second um, thing right on our agenda. And obviously, linking into the presentation earlier from Paul, um, and BrightPay is looking at the payroll and the auto-enrollment administration. And I think it's a huge opportunity for us in terms of the volume of people that are going to be looking at auto-enrollment administration and saying, actually, I don't want to get involved in there. So I think there's a, a great opportunity for you to administer someone's auto-enrollment and to manage that on their process. And you can see, from, for example, from the software offered by BrightPay, how easy that can potentially be um, for us to do. As I say, I think the advisor role is becoming more and more important. I think production of management accounts, not just producing black and white numbers, but making sure they're relevant, making sure they're personalized around the key performance indicators of that business, and using sensitive, sensitivity analysis in terms of what if your business changes over the next few months, how that's going to impact. Again, coming back to this whole thing about complementary products and services that you may be able to offer your, your customers. So just to finish off, I really wanted to talk about once you know what it is that you want to offer in 2016, how can you make sure, in terms of that growth, how are you going to make that happen? And one of the things I am very passionate about is effective goal planning. In 2007, I did some research into effective goal planning to try and understand what it was that made or helped people to achieve their goals or stop them from achieving their goals. And I just wanted to highlight 10 steps that I work through, but actually all I'm going to do is focus on steps three, four, five, and six, because what most people do with their goal planning is they define the goal, step one, and then they jump to step eight and start to build the action steps that they need or believe they need to, to, to achieve that goal. Just reflecting back on th steps three and four, three and four is basically your pain and gain. What's the the gain of achieving your goal and what's the pain of not achieving their goal. Visualize those, 
document those that are there, there for you as a reminder on a regular basis, and I can assure you there will be strong motivation for you to want to achieve that goal. Step five is then to envisage the obstacles that you're likely to face on that, way, on that journey of achieving your goal. And I think we can all quite easily think about obstacles that stops us achieving our goals, and if we spend a lot of time thinking about this area, we can really get to the depth of what's stopping us from achieving our goals. But the power comes into then step six, is establishing the solutions to those obstacles. Because when you know the solutions to those obstacles, you can build those into your action steps in step eight, and therefore then your action steps become like a checklist. If you go down your checklist, tick, 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 and you tick off a solution, in theory, and I appreciate it's theory, but in theory, the obstacle should never arrive. And therefore, if the obstacles never arrive, you should achieve your goal. And I can assure you I've seen this applied by myself a number of successfully times and also with my clients. And lastly, I just want to talk about high power of activities. And again, those that have heard me speak before will know I'm very passionate about high power of activities. High power of activities predominantly links into how we achieve our mission, vision, goal, and objectives. But I'd encourage you to work backwards from the flow that I've got here. So start with your mission, vision, goal, and objective. What is it you want to achieve in 2016 and beyond? Then establish, say, for example, five targets that actually if you achieve those five targets, you will achieve your vision, mission, goal, and objective. So for example, your vision, mission may be that you want to double the size of your business in 2016. Your targets may be thinking about the number of customers you want, the number of staff you want, what type of systems you have to have in place. And then the high payoff activities are there for the various different activities that you have to implement to achieve that target. Hence, they're called the high payoff activities. So therefore, to attract one of my targets, the number of customers that I need, what are the activities I need to do? Do I need to go to networking events? Do I need to be doing some direct mail? Do I need to be doing some telephone calls? Or what type of volume of activity do I need to do? And therefore, the idea would be that you just simply focus on the high power activities. And if you achieve the high power activities, you should achieve the targets, and therefore you should achieve the mission, vision, goal, and objective. So I hope that's been a useful overview for you in terms of my thoughts about how you can take your business forward in 2016, how you can expand your offering and hopefully grow your business. I'm going to hand over back to Karen or Paul. <laughs> Thanks a million, Mike. That was really good. Um, there's really good practical tips there um, that people yeah. can get their, their teeth um, into. So I'm just going to show our screen here. Um, and I think, yeah, the relationship management that you have with your clients is, is very, very important. And I suppose time management as well is, is, is an issue that many, um, many businesses struggle with. Yeah, it actually brought me back a bit when I when I started up my own accounting practice. Well, it was what thirty years ago, nearly. Um, and what Mike was saying there about friends and family and market research, mm. I know at the time uh, I had a number of friends and family that said, "Yeah, I'll definitely go with you. I want you to be my accountant." But when I actually started up, no, none of them came to me, <laughs> <laughs> and it was a case that uh, the source of the business that I did actually achieve over a long period of time uh, were completely unexpected so it, you know the market research side of it is certainly a, a point well worth noting yeah absolutely and I know I have been on Mike's website the bookkeepers Alliance um, there recently that like it's just been set up in the last few months and it is really really a great resource you know um, for training and different blogs about sales and sales and marketing so we'll just go through the last few slides so thanks a, a million for Vicky there for going through that demonstration if anybody did want a more in-depth demo and um, there's a link there we also have a lot of auto enrollment guides and um, so there's another link there and then we have um, more auto enrollment webinars coming up next year one that might be of particular interest to um, payroll bureaus bookkeepers and accountants um, would be um, how to charge um, your clients for auto enrollment services. You can see here we also have the next one coming up on the 12th of January, essential questions to ask your payroll provider. So they would be questions just to make sure that you're covered for auto enrollment. And then we have Griselda who will be from Smart Pensions and she'll be running through how to choose a quality scheme. Um, we also have a number of CPD automatic enrollment training um, sessions that will be running next year and they're very in-depth. They go on for approximately two hours. 
So that's a very, very good re resource as well. So all of those links will be, will be available to people after the webinar. We do have a few questions coming through there already, but if you do have any questions about the Bright Pay presentation today, um, if you type them into the question bar, we'll get, get, get to them now. Questions are going to be taken by Paul Byrne and also Victoria Clark is going to um, join Paul for the questions. And Victoria is the, the support manager um, on the UK side, so she's a lot of experience, I suppose, dealing firsthand with any issues that people have and any questions that people have. Okay, so we have a question there. Um, will Bright Pay auto enrollment work with four weekly pay? And that's from Elaine there. Yes, yeah. Um, we cater for six pay frequencies in Bright Pay, so yeah, the automatic enrollment, regardless of the pay frequency you're, you're on, um, your AE duties will kick in at the right time for you. Okay, um, another question. So is there a cloud version of Bright Pay? No, uh, BrightPay is actually a desktop package. However, just to, to say that, that there are a number of web features built into BrightPay. Uh, another useful uh, thing is that the, for each employer, it's the one file. So, for example, it's like Word or Excel. It's, it's like one of those documents. Um, you can actually save the employer file continuously to, say, a folder within Dropbox so that you know, it's available for any other uh, computers that you have to share the same clients or whatever. Um, we do know that a lot of accountants also use a uh, host of desktop environments um, and it seems to work fine with those. Uh, we are in the process of developing employee self-service uh, which you know would, would be completely cloud-based as well and uh, an, an accountant's portal as such where their clients can actually uh, transfer information through a web, a web browser or whatever which would be branded for that accountant or bookkeeper. Um, okay, so. fantastic. Um, okay, so we have a question here about the Nest Pension Scheme. So with regards to setting up a Nest Pension Scheme, is this something that you would see that the accountant would, would do on behalf of the employer, or would the, this be the employer themselves that would need to register? Yeah, I think once the employer has chosen uh, Nest as their pension scheme, it is important to point out that it's the employer's of the duty to actually choose a pension scheme, the accountant can advise them on that choice, the bookkeeper can advise them on that choice. But once that's been done, yes, I, I would see it uh, as being the accountant or bookkeeper who would actually provide that service for them. And, and Nest have a, a feature within their, uh, called Nest Connect, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, where you know, basically the accountant or bookkeeper is a, a nominated contact and can perform those duties like registration and then submitting the files there on, thereafter for them. And just, just to go back to that NEST issue, we do have some more webinars next year and NEST are, are going to be guest speakers on one and I think they'll be going through the, the NEST Connect and you know going through any questions that people have. So if you click on that link, you'll be able to, to join that webinar next week or next year. Um, I actually have a, a question here for you, Mike. Um, so time in reality is very limited for me. So if I could only do one thing short term, what what should I do? <laughs> so that's a bit of a hard question there. Yeah, good, good question. Yeah, you know, like I say, it's time is a uh, is there an essence for everybody. I think if there's one one thing I would focus on for my marketing is very much understanding the profile of my ideal client, because I think. It, every, everything about our ideal client profile leads towards effective marketing and I think I see a lot of businesses doing their marketing and in effect I call it firing a shotgun and hoping it hits somebody mm -hmm. rather than trying to take a rifle out and trying to pick out their ideal prospects and I think people are a bit concerned about you know, very much profiling their, their marketing but at the end of the day those people that still come from referrals or still find you on the web by surfing for XY service will still find you it's just what you're doing with your limited resources in terms of time and money can be a lot more effective if you if you profile that ideal client and as I said earlier what's their true pain problem and fear that you can help them with Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Um, there's another question here as well. So, um, just asking about the Bookkeepers Alliance. So, how can I find find out more uh, or consider joining? Okay, well, thank you, Karen. You've been you've been very kind. Mentioned that a couple of times. Um, 
We, we started the Bookkeepers Alliance as a membership organization for bookkeepers and their continual professional development, and we launched that the 1st of October. The best place really is to go to our website, which is www www.bookkeepersalliance.co.uk. You can have a look at the different membership options that we've got available. Yeah, there is, I think that there's uh, different membership options on, on the website. And yeah, if you just Google Bookkeepers Alliance, as I said, there, there is a lot of training um, available and a lot of blogs on, on sales and marketing. And, and I, I think Mark, uh, Mike is starting to do a lot of videos as well on, on YouTube, and um, which are, are really, really helpful because I've joined a few of them as well myself. Um, so there's just a few more questions for, for Paul and Vicky here. Um, okay, da, 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 da. is there a trial version of BrightPay? Yes, there is. Uh, it's a 60 day uh, free trial period uh, when you download BrightPay. Um, it's full functionality during that 60 day uh, period as well. Um, it's also worth saying that uh, if you've only three employees or less, right pay is free, so that's that's uh, unlimited or sort of indefinite period of time. So yeah. you could try that, say, on your your own payroll if you want. Absolutely, and I know I, I suppose from speaking to a lot of our, our our bureau customers, particularly, they might I suppose have a few clients that they might necessarily want to process the auto enrollment or the payroll for you know, just maybe in terms of pricing. So a lot of them are, are telling them about the free license that we have for up to three employees and, and there's free support there as well. Mm -hmm. So it really is um, a good tool. Um, so I think there's just one more question coming through and I think we'll wrap up then. Um, so can you postpone an employee more than once? Yes, you can. Um, when you initially postpone them, uh, when the postponement period then comes to an end, um, if they are, you, you have to reassess them at that stage. If they are less than the earnings trigger uh, when that period ends, uh, okay, you, you, you need to notify them that they have the option to opt in. Um, sorry, am I getting this right? No, no, yeah, we go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, no, the, the important point to note is, yes, you can. However, if, if after, the, after a period of postponement ends, that they, they are still... Uh, classed as eligible job holders, then you must enroll them at that stage. You can't continue continuously do back-to-back -back postpones. Is mm -hmm. that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we don't have any more questions coming through there, but all of our contact details are on the slides and they'll be on the follow-up details that we have. So absolutely, if you have any more questions, just feel free to send us an email. So I'd like to thank Mike, who's unfortunately hopefully gone. Can, hopefully you can hear us thanking him. <laughs> uh, for joining us today, because that was really insightful um, on, on, I suppose, different areas of growth and how to manage your time. And thanks to Paul and Victoria. So have a good week, everybody. And thanks a million for joining us today. Okay, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.